Um, well, hey, thanks everybody uh, for joining um, the, I guess this is the fall edition of our California Tableau user group meeting. Um, of course, it is a virtual one. This is our second uh, virtual meeting and it looks like the, for at least the foreseeable future that will be the case. Um, so just to review the agenda here real quick, um, I do have a, uh, a couple announcements, mostly about TC20. Also want to make sure I get the, um, the, the team introduced um, as far as any uh, resources that you may want to get in contact with. Um, and then we're going to jump quickly into several really, really good presentations. And I, I really like the mix of these presentations because I think uh, the first one is City of Carlsbad. They actually did a, um, this presentation for a Tableau user group down in Southern California. Um, and it was uh, very well received and they basically kind of goes from, you know, being new to Tableau to where they are today and the value that that's pre presenting. So really looking forward to that one. Um, and then I, I like the fact that we're really kind of getting into a specific use case. Obviously, most people know that here in the state of California, the Tableau is being used to uh, on some of the dashboards and such with the COVID-19 um, response. And um, the one of the consulting firms that was involved in that or the consulting firm um, Analytica is going to do a presentation on that. And lastly, and this is kind of one of the things we hear from customers quite a bit is that, you know, they, they really like to have these meetings. It's great to have, you know, overviews of use cases and show nice pretty dashboards and all that, but also really come away with some new knowledge about how to use Tableau. And Greg Hall over at UCSF did a presentation that was very popular at his, at his uh, UCSF Tableau user group meeting. Um, actually also got recorded and it was out, it's, I think it's out there on YouTube that anybody can go back and look at as well. So we've asked him to uh, give a presentation on that. So I think we had a really nice mix of, of presentations here. Um, and then at the end, we'll, we'll have wrap up questions. Please ask questions uh, via chat um, as we go forward here. We've got several of us that will be monitoring that and we can certainly respond to you or make sure we save those questions towards the end. Um, so that's the agenda. Um, I just need to screen. Okay, um, again, um, this is the Tableau team for most of the folks on this call. Um, we have invited others that, that can join. So you've got your own account managers and your own technical resource. But um, Kenny and I manage the state of California. Um, both of us are here right here in the uh, Sacramento area. Um, our technical counterpart is Jared Scott. Um, this is the first time, Jared, we are letting you off the hook and not asking you to do a presentation. So uh, Jared is actually- <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Soon welcoming his second child. So he's on call and we're not going to uh, do anything where we have to have him at a particular day or time. So, um, but um, Jared's a great resource. So anybody needs to uh, talk to somebody from a technical standpoint, uh, um, obviously on the, whether it's the you know, creation of dashboards or the technical side of server, things like that. Obviously Jared is our guy here. Either get a hold of him direct or you can get a hold of him through Kenny and I. Um, Gina is the person that if anybody's looking to get um, software quotes or just a lot of, you know, all the cats and dogs, I guess, that come with Tableau. She is certainly the person that supports Kenny and I on, on that. Um, and then uh, Del Singh, customer success manager. I'm not sure if Dell's able to join this call or not, but one of the really neat things about Tableau over the last few years is we've really expanded our customer success program. And so several of the folks on the call here probably have already been introduced to Dell but his team is really responsible for, you know, helping with the adoption of Tableau and helping you move forward with Tableau in your organizations. So let us know if we can uh, put him in touch with any of you on that. And lastly, uh, Kelly, um, I'm not sure if she's on it or, or not, but she is your renewals manager, does a great job or anything when it comes to renewing, helping you with portal, aligning your accounts so they all come up at the same time, all that other good stuff. That's what uh, Kelly supports us on. Um, so again, we'll, we'll make this available for everybody. So you'll have this as far as contact information, or I guess in this world, everyone can just do a screenshot right now and they've got it now. Um, now, the announcement that I really want to make is um, that our TC20, this was the slide I initially had of the heading, heads back to Vegas. Well, we're not going to Vegas, obviously. So um, there is a, uh, a new approach to, T to the Tableau Conference uh, 2020. It is going to be virtual. I like the Tableau conference-ish, <laughs> but uh, we are very excited about this because there, you know, anybody that's ever been to a TC um, knows that there's incredible value, just incredible. I mean, all, all the sessions are just so amazing and we've got a lot of good customer sessions. Uh, you can learn about the product. You can learn about how it's being used. You can meet with a lot of your um, other state, local education customers. Um, obviously a little bit more challenging this year, but the good news is 
Um, it is free, so anybody can join, and this is the page. I'm gonna click here on the, if I just click here on the link. Um, basically, you just register online. You can start building your schedule. Um, I will say that, as Kenny knows, Kenny and I know that um, a lot of our customers, state of California, not so much the, all my UC customers, they, they tend to be able to go to these conferences, um, you know, on, a, on a, a lot easier than some of our state of California customers. Uh, here in Sacramento, where it's very difficult to go to Las Vegas. So the good news is you don't have to go to Las Vegas. Las Vegas is coming to you. So really encourage you to get involved. This is actually one of the reasons we didn't ask Jared to do a presentation um, from a kind of what's new standpoint, because there's going to be all kinds of what's new stuff coming up here um, on October 6th through the 8th. So really encourage you to sign up for this and, you know, attend whatever sessions you can. We know you're all busy and you're, you know, working from home. And, but if you can squeeze something, I do know Wednesday morning, I believe it's Wednesday morning from eight to noon, we've got some really sled focus. We use that word sled thinking everyone knows what it means, but state, local education um, uh, session. So it's really a lot of stuff on that particular morning, I think might be a, a particular value. Um, so if you need more information about this, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, but I, I, I really encourage you to, to join if you can. Hey, Mike, can you put the link, that link right there in the chat for everyone? I can. Yeah, you know what, I'm gonna put, uh, yeah, I'm gonna do that, thank you. Good reminder, I will do that right after I'm done talking. Okay. And There it is. Okay. And I think that's it. We're going to do the wrap up at the end. So, um, Kenny, that's everything I had to say. If there's any questions again, please throw them out in chat either to the greater group or individually. That's fine. And we'll, we'll, we'll stay on top of that and respond. And uh, other than that, I'm going to stop sharing and pass this over to the city of Carlsbad. Thanks, Mike. So, as we transition over, City of Carlsbad it was gracious enough to share their experience and their Tableau journey. Um, so I thought, thought uh, it would be interesting for the group to hear about um, uh, some of the, the things that they're doing there. So Greg's gonna sh start sharing and Mike, um, if you can throw that uh, link over to people, I think they're interested in the chat again. Thank you. So with that, let's, uh, I can see your screen. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So the city of Carlsbad, uh, I'll go ahead and lead it off. Uh, I'm David Van Gilloway, the uh, business intelligence and data science manager here at the city of Carlsbad. And uh, thank you for the opportunity for us to uh, be able to share some of Carlsbad's great work and uh, hopefully I'll be able to see all of you at a subsequent conference uh, after COVID-19 is all done uh, whenever that time does come. But uh, I'm hired out of the uh, Office of Innovation and Economic Development here at Carlsbad. What we wanted to kind of go over and talk to all of you about is some of the things we're doing in Carlsbad. Uh, if your department or division is thinking about expanding their uh, tableau capacity, some strategies and ways you might think about it and in working with leadership and also some uh, cool things that we're doing with tableau today in the organization. But uh, uh, first I want to start out with kind of how we postured ourselves with leadership to be able to do more advanced analytics and data driven decisions. Um, in April 2019, we uh, revised a, a six month uh, community feedback driven approach to developing a smart community roadmap that uh, would challenge the organization to apply data first approaches for decision making. And this leadership level strategy is important to ensure that the technology and implementation of data infrastructure and products like Tableau aligns with the larger goals of the organization and prioritizes investment and resources accordingly. And then we'll go to the next slide. You know, Carlsbad's uh, community roadmap originally had five uh, goals. And uh, the first goal was to modernize our citywide infrastructure and provide the data flow backbone for an increase in IoT and connected infrastructure such as smart street lights, real time traffic signal monitoring, traffic pattern analysis, parking management, uh, water flow analysis. Stormwater measurements, sewer, and more. 
our second point on there was, and the rest of our points are all about harnessing that data, all of that sensor data, all of that IoT, all the new information we're collecting and those that we already have. We have these vast amounts of data we already collect. How would we capitalize on all of that information, make rich data-driven decisions, increase engagement and transparency, and how to deal with the not uncommon problem of having a mountain of data in different places and different access methods and our organizational need to put all those data sets together and see it all in one place. You know, uh, at that time, we wanted to look deeper into Tableau and Tableau Prep and Tableau Server and see how we could join all those areas together and allow for uh, non-technical users, most importantly, to start harnessing the power of their data. And so we needed to take our Tableau individual use by a few users and some of our big data champions and expand that number of Tableau creators, expedite kind of that distribution of insights and create a culture of finding answers with data. We needed to empower those non-technical users outside of IT to find their own answers and create impactful analytics that are dependable and repeatable. And so as we were looking at launching our uh, deeper dive into Tableau, COVID-19 had just hit and it shifted our workforce priorities and put a lot of our upcoming projects on hold, probably like a lot of you. And so we revised our long-term data enrichment strategy and looked at a short-term one-year challenge. We said, okay, uh, maybe what we can do is without a huge investment, we can take Tableau and a small instance of server and see if it has a shorter payoff than traditional software implementations of multiple years and just try to do it as a one year sprint challenge and see how that would go. I have to give a shout out to uh, Sarah Swanbeck and those at Tableau for helping me think creatively and in an agile way to try to implement Tableau server in our environment. Uh, the, Tableau was able to give us a 30-day trial of on-premise Tableau server so we could basically prove out if the technical requirements were met within our own environment, wiring up our agency's OAuth single sign-on provider with AD failback, and all kinds of other uh, you know, uh, tricks and things that you need to make sure of before you uh, get going with something in your own environment. It was nice because we could basically just uh, try it before we ever had to worry about buying it and having it not meet some of our stringent security requirements within the organization. So this enabled IT to kind of quickly green light the server platform as being capable, matching within our security practices and our infrastructure, kind of without that prolonged requirements gathering, deep critical RFP, RFQ process. So we were able to confirm the fit and configuration with a light demo of Tableau and what it could bring to the departments, even before we signed on for a single year agreement, which is great. Uh, with that, we said, okay, let's do a small instance of Tableau server. Let's get uh, so many creator licenses and a bunch of viewer licenses and see what we can get done in a year. And then we'll let the organization know what we think the capacity is, what we think the benefit of Tableau server is within our org and move forward. So down there, there's the uh, two bullet points that are in gold there. I could probably spend a whole presentation talking about the last two, but they're the most critical to democratizing our data. Building capacity and increasing adoption for our first year was uh, definitely an important part and the only way to really uh, change people's approaches to how they deal with their own information. A key part of our success was bringing on an intern who learned Tableau and could also assist with delivering one-on-one -on -one trainings with staff, track the level of Tableau training per person and do follow-up trainings with data sets that the user provided. Uh, in that, uh, the intern I was working with had a lot of success with our staff and growing our Tableau footprint and also was able to convert his internship to a position here at the city. It was fairly easy to do. He would already worked with plenty of people in the last uh, three months, logged over 20 hours of individual group and, uh, it, and individual one-on-one -on -one training. And which was great because all the trainings we wanted to do, we didn't want to just provide the standard training that you can get um, online or with big group trainings. We wanted to make sure that each individual could use their own data sets 
so that even that training by itself was impactful and value immediately because we'd start with a problem that they wanted to solve and then show them how they could solve it with Tableau instead of Excel or uh, try to do other uh, basic visualizations like they were uh, previous. And so with that, we were able to kind of escape the no normal paradigm of which department's gonna pay for this by doing a short trial run of it with a sprint to say, we're gonna buy this on an organizational level and then see who has interest in it. And if they do, uh, they have to take some one-on-one -on -one training with us and we'll fully support them as they develop some of their own data sets for management to show insights immediately. And so I think we've been pretty successful at that. We're about halfway through this uh, one-year challenge now, most of it uh, during COVID time. So I thought it'd be interesting to present a little bit on the strategy, but uh, uh, this is only part of the presentation, which is kind of the policy and strategy side. Let's actually look at some cool um, tableau visualizations that we're also doing here in Carlsbad and some of what different departments are doing, especially the great stuff we're doing in public works. And for that, I'll turn it over to Greg. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Greg McClellan. I'm the Senior Business Systems Specialist for the Public Works Branch here at the City of Carlsbad. Um, I've been here at the city for over 20 years and today um, I will be talking about um, some of the challenges that Public Works had with its data and with its many different departments. Um, and then I'll focus on one of the dashboards that we created for our wastewater group. Um, and then Nate Johnson um, from the business systems team um, will uh, take over the presentation and talk about his experience um, with a project he worked on for the capital improvement uh, program. Um, so moving forward, uh, the public works branch consists of five departments here at the city of Carlsbad uh, that include utilities, which is water and wastewater, um, our transportation department, environmental management, fleet and facilities, and construction management and inspection. Um, and the business systems group um, is in charge of helping all of these different departments with their technology needs. So we do everything from help manage their technology projects to help them configure um, their business systems, um, help them with their business process and then also help them pull uh, their data and visualize it in a meaningful way so that they can make data driven decisions. Um, with the five different departments, we have around 14 different systems that we um, have to help support. Um, and then this creates a lot of problems in of itself um, because we have so many different data sets. So in the past, um, what would happen is we'd have a business group that would have a business need and we'd help them figure out how to track it in one of these many systems. Um, and then they would want to be able to see the data um, that they'd been tracking. So um, we would use Crystal Reports was kind of our main reporting uh, tool. And we would create a lot of uh, scheduled reports that would send them PDFs and they would be able to look and see metrics on their different divisions. But the problem was um, with Crystal Reports, it's a snapshot, right? And it's not very interactive and it doesn't really answer all of the questions. So um, we started looking at different platforms a few years ago and uh, started using uh, Tableau Online. And um, we were able to kind of leverage that and, and show the different departments the value in being able to see their data in an interactive form like that. And then when David joined um, the, the organization, it really helped our cause and bringing Tableau Server online has, has helped us um, kind of reimagine how we view our data and, and who has access to it within the organization. So now a lot of these crystal reports that we created over the years, we're now transitioning over um, onto Tableau Server 
um, with different dashboards for the, the different groups so that they can see their data in real time and in a more streamlined approach. Um, in Tableau Server, we've created, uh, you know, different folders for each of the departments. And then within those uh, department folders, we have divisional folders um, where we have operational dashboards for them to be able to view uh, different information as far as what we're looking at here, the employee hours, so they can drill down on specific employees, see um, what type of work that they've been working on, um, how much leave they've been using, um, and then really get into the detail of the data, something that really we couldn't do earlier with some of our other reporting mechanisms. Um, and then it also allowed us to create dashboards um, that are specific to um, maybe a work type. So um, one that we did was for um, our wastewater group and it had to do with their pipeline assessment. And I'm gonna bring up that dashboard um, so that you can take a look at it. And so what we did is they, they go out and they um, have a CCTV truck and they uh, video um, the sewer pipes within the city. And before they used to have to come back into the yard and then to view or understand what was going on in the field, the engineers would have to use the CCTV uh, software and kind of go one inspection at a time to see what the results of the inspections were. So we created this dashboard that kind of brought all that data into one view for them. And then you can see that um, up at the top, we created parameters so that they could just come in and select the month and the fiscal year that they wanted to view for the inspections. And then they could also pick uh, the scoring threshold from the inspection um, and how they wanted to see it. And then that would then uh, give us a view on the status bar and we can see that 79 of the inspections were below the threshold. Um, and then we can also see all of those inspections on the GIS map here. Um, and we have it broken down by uh, maintenance zone. And so if an engineer wanted to see specifically what was going on with, let's say, um, these scores, the two that were 90 to 100, they can click on that. And then that will then display those um, inspections um, that are, were related there. And then they can come over and the GIS map will um, uh, adjust to what they selected and we can come over and highlight the uh, inspection uh, section of pipe that they looked at and we can see a pop-up of what zone it's in, what the unit ID is, when the inspection was done, what the actual score was. Um, and then there's also links to the videos, um, which I won't click on here because I don't have the proper player. Uh, but the engineers do. And so they would be able to actually double click on the video using Tableau links and it would link them to the actual video of the inspection that, that they could view. Um, and then also finally at the bottom, they can see the actual uh, individual scores um, by distance within the pipe, how far the camera was in and then what the actual um, inspection uh, scores were for that run. So this has really helped um, our uh, wastewater team uh, more efficiently go through um, hundreds and, and even thousands of inspections and figure out um, where the, the work is needed and, and where there needs to be more um, uh, maintenance done and um, really has streamlined um, that process. Um, and so with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Nate so that he can start talking about uh, CIP. All right, Greg, thank you. I'll start sharing here. And maximize this. Does that look right? 
that's oh, that does very good. Yeah, good. And everybody can hear me all right. Good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Greg, and thank you, Dave. Uh, this part of the presentation will focus on how we use Tableau to support our capital improvement program at the city of Carlsbad. It was back in March last year in 2019 that our city manager updated our processes and procedures for how each project is initiated or prioritized, uh, how they get budgeted and ultimately adopted. And in that uh, executive or administrative order was a, a goal to review business systems and try to utilize the latest technology to support these processes, including scheduling and budgeting. And what we found that in the past, prior to putting in Tableau and some other systems, it was difficult for our senior management analysts to organize and communicate project information. And this was because obviously the information was stored in Word documents and spreadsheets and in our financial system. And it just took her too much time to pull that together. She knew exactly what questions were going to be asked of the data. So that really helped us to organize a database in SQL Server to house the information we needed to do to do future analytics. We used ArcGIS as a method for storing and managing all the location information that comes with it and to do some spatial analytics on proximity. But we used Tableau quite a bit. It worked for so many good reasons and the ultimate result was just better and quicker communication. And that communication helped with better collaboration between different groups where projects might conflict. And then uh, we ended up sharing things with the public which helped with transparency and ultimately with all of our decision making. So we use Tableau to create many uh, visualizations. And today I wanna to focus on this one. This is called the budget book report. This is a report. It's a final list of all of our projects that are approved in our CIP. It's kind of the end goal. And everyone in the city, including the public, use this report. And with Tableau desktop, we automated this report and it became published in our 2021 operating budget and capital improvement program. We were able to use Tableau workbook to develop reports that helped our senior management analysts respond to the many questions she would get. And through that process, we learned these common questions, which helped us to design and build an interactive dashboard that we're looking at here. It started by using, Dave uh, on the call had built a custom SQL uh, script that helped us take what was a very wide database and union it to actually help organize it, which helped us create these visualizations. So this Tableau's custom SQL capability allowed us to connect to the enterprise project database and structure the data in a way that made it easy to produce these analyses. As the CIP database is also integrated with our financial system, it allowed us to create an interactive dashboard. And that shares timely and accurate information with our executives and steering committee and with project managers who actually enter all the data. So it's good for them to be able to visualize data that they enter that actually helped with quality control and quality assurance. This dashboard has been published to Tableau server and the dashboard allows our users to perform their own queries. So such as uh, our finance department, we're constantly monitoring the amount of funding by funding source over here to make sure that we didn't exceed available budgets as we were in that budgeting and scheduling process. This part over here on project phase, this visualization was used quite a bit because people wanted to query for projects by uh, the phase that they were in. For example, we recently queried out those that were, in, that were closed out or completed or canceled to see what remaining budgets could be used for other purposes. When COVID hit back in March and April of last year and many businesses were closed, we were able to look for projects that were shovel ready and see if we could alter their schedules to take advantage of 
businesses being closed and therefore reducing the impact to their business and, and the public. Uh, ultimately, it just became very easy for our users to ask their own questions and make their own reports. In this case, I wanted to find all high priority transportation projects that were using gas tax funding and then here's the list, which could be easily exported or just reviewed for other purposes. I'd say that through this, the greatest lesson I learned was that with Tableau, questions could be answered so quickly. And because of that, more questions were asked. Another lesson learned, I had never used Tableau prior to this project and had about a one hour jumpstart training with one of our business uh, associates. Uh, I found Tableau's documentation to be excellent. Their training programs were very helpful and the user community was powerful with the scripts that have been put up in different ways people do things. It's really helped. So what used to take days or weeks now just takes minutes. Overall, Tableau was a great tool and helped play a critical role in creating our ultimate budget, which is a balanced, our ultimate goal, which is a balanced budget, and achieve our goal for continuous improvement. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ty. I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Nate. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so yes, thank you again, Nate, for uh, walking us through the CIP process. And thank you very much, Greg, for the deep down and dirty look at the data for the sewer system. That is definitely governmental transparency at its best. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ty Gillespie. I was with the Public Works Department uh, about seven, eight years ago when we started looking into data analysis tools. I was there for several years as we started to get a little bit of traction as well. I uh, moved from there to the community development department where I took on a role to try to help improve technology implementation and user adoptions. And recently this year, moved to IT in a similar role. At each of these places, we were able to help each of the business units get a little bit more ca capacity in their data-driven decision-making aspects. So, so far in this presentation, we've looked at some of the high level ideas. We've looked at connected Carlsbad goals, as well as the Tableau server implementation. Uh, we looked at public works. They are one of the more mature users in the organization. And so they have a lot of solutions that are really instructive. What I'm going to do is kind of summarize or synopsize some thoughts that we've used as we've implemented Tableau and kind of increased its adoption. So this is our unofficial Tableau implementation playbook, as it were. So what we look to do, solve a problem always. Uh, we know we can't do everything, but we will do what we can. And we like to make sure that we're bringing others along. So when we think of solving a problem, uh, essentially this is making sure that when we implement technology, we're not looking at just the new shiny cool stuff, we're looking for things that actually bring value to the business. And so we've seen a couple of examples of those with the public works group. One of the first problems we solved with public works was actually uh, reducing the amount of time that it takes to prepare for monthly business meetings. Now these business meetings were where the divisions or the departments would look at their work management data matrix and try to make sure that everything was on track. It was a great idea. Unfortunately, it would take about a week time of a business analyst to prepare for those meetings. So a week in advance, the analyst starts running reports, the static reports that we had in Crystal that, that Greg mentioned, exporting information from there, getting additional information with ad hoc SQL queries, combining that in Excel, creating visualizations, printing that stuff out, preparing it for uh, the meeting and then presenting it at the meeting. Now, as each of the business units or the divisions started to think that this was a better idea, more and more of them did it, which meant that the amount of time spent on this activity just increased. What we did was we started with the new divisions implementing some of the data visualization tools. While we were doing that, we were able to quickly reduce the amount of time that it took to prepare for the meetings and increase the flexibility that we had in those meetings. We could answer questions a lot faster with this method. And so once we saw the value of that, it was, it was easier to move that tool 
and use that with the other divisions and then later with other departments. Now you've heard a couple of times uh, from both Dave and Greg that we do not have a data warehouse. So we do not have one place that we go to. We can't go to one spot and get all the data that we're looking for. Um, we've got SQL Server databases, we have SaaS solutions, some of which we can make API calls, others we have to manually download data. And internally, we have data stored in all sorts of data file sources. So we don't have an easy way to deal with that. But what we can do, and what we've been able to do, is use the tools that we do have. Being a Microsoft shop, we have Power Automate, so we've made use of that, as well as Excel, uh, VBA, we've used Microsoft Access, we've dabbled with Alteryx, and recently we've started using Tableau Prep. So even though we don't have that, a single place that we can go to, we've been able to cobble together some, some solutions and do what we can to kind of keep getting traction and keep providing value to the business. And finally, you also heard a lot uh, about the training. We wanna make sure that we're bringing others along. That's uh, a couple of things. Uh, Dave mentioned a program that he started. Uh, Nate indicated some help he's gotten. That's been a part of the process at the City of Carlsbad for a while. We've also looked to see where we could show folks what we're doing. And one of the interesting things that was really helpful was when David came along, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel completely, he really tried to use the grassroots approach and make sure he could utilize what was being used internally as well as continue to provide solutions for those needs. Um, one thing I did wanna highlight or reiterate um, is the use of interns. It turns out to be a great professional development learning experience, and it also provides an additional resource internally so that we can get some of the visualizations and some of the work done that we might not otherwise have the bandwidth for. So, that was a quick glimpse, some of the things that we're doing at the city of Carlsbad. I wanna thank each of you for your time. And I will hand it, I will stop sharing. Thanks so much. We appreciate uh, the city of Carlsbad and their perspective with regards to, um, you know, local government is always at the forefront um, down on rubber meets the road types of activities. So uh, we appreciate uh, local government and their perspective as always. Um, so again, thanks for taking the time to, to present to us. Uh, you know, maybe we'll take uh, a minute or two to look in the uh, chat to make sure that there isn't any questions in there before we hand it off to Steve from Analytica Consulting. Look, looks like we're good. I, I think we're good. Okay. On the yep, yeah. we're good on the chat. Yep. Great. So with that, um, we're going to turn it over uh, to Steve from Analytica Consulting. Uh, they have been um, knee deep, I would say, into COVID um, at the, since the beginning for the state of California. They've done some really great things. They've been over at uh, CDPH and public health for, for a long time. And so we invited Steve to talk about uh, some COVID dashboards uh, that they've developed and really what their response looks like. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and he can share his presentation. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Or I guess you guys can't respond, but yes, everybody we can hear you. You guys can hear me? One second, I've got to enable Zoom to allow my screen. Okay, let's try this. Yep, looks good. I think you guys are recording and that's throwing off the security. So I don't know if it's gonna allow it, but. Um, this, uh, we can see your screen. You guys can see the screen? Okay, yes, good. We're good. Good, I was getting some odd error messages. Okay. All right. So knee deep is definitely an understatement. <laughs> I would say that, uh, you know, we've been, um, we sank to the bottom with everybody else along with the COVID effort. And now I think we're slowly coming up for water and we're waiting for the next giant wave to come in and getting prepared for that. So today I'm going to walk you through what we've been doing 
with uh, the state of California. So we're working with multiple agencies to, to work to the, for the COVID-19 pandemic effort and using data to sort of manage that effort, both for the governor's office, uh, for the Department of Public Health, for Department of Healthcare Services, um, the Health and Human Services Agency of California, and Department of Technology. So I'll walk you through um, this massive effort that we've been a part of since everything began show you the challenges, and then uh, if we have time, show you some of the end results of the work that we've done. So background about me real quick. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Analytica Consulting. I started the company back in 2014. Prior to that, I was the director uh, of analytics globally at Qualcomm down here in San Diego. Uh, I essentially managed, uh, you know, almost like an internal consulting firm inside the company where we worked with every facet of the business using analytics to help improve business processes, chipset designs, um, solve HR issues, solve financial problems. Uh, I did that for close to a decade. I worked for the C-suite there for a number of years. Prior to that, I was a principal consultant at Accenture. I worked with the media and high tech doing a lot of analytics. So all in all, close to 20 years of experience within the analytics, IT, and software engineering space. So my firm, specifically what we do is we focus on helping our clients use data and analytics to, to essentially solve problems. And the problems can vary from improving patient outcomes to helping a product design get launched a lot quicker to you know, even helping the bottom line of an organization. Um, we do everything and anything related to data. So uh, visualization is obviously a key aspect of that in dashboard development, but we also do quite a bit of data engineering and data architecture, as well as um, more significant um, data solutions in the fields of data science, machine learning, and predictive analytics and statistical modeling. We have two offices. Our office down here in San Diego works uh, with a lot of the large organizations here that are local. So we work with many of the healthcare systems like Brady Children's Hospital, uh, the UC SD medical system down here. Up north, we work with uh, the state of California and some of the large entities up in the Sacramento area. So we work with the Department of Public Health, Department of Social Services, Air Resources Board, Department of Technology, um, so on and so forth. And then we also do quite a bit of work with SMUD uh, which is the big utility up there. So here's the, and I hope this isn't getting blocked, so I'm going to turn off the camera. I hope you guys can see this whole screen. Um, but here's the timeline of how things sort of came about. So the first known community transmission of COVID began uh, in the U.S. in February. And what we did was when we saw that, we were working with the Department of Public Health at that point for, you know, we were going on year four. Um, and we have quite a bit of healthcare analytics expertise. So we basically took it upon ourselves to start educating the public. And we published a Tableau dashboard. Uh, it got a lot of great press. It was published in the San Diego Union Tribune. It was published on tableau.com. And that dashboard was, you know, in its nature, quite simplistic back then, but it used um, very accurate data. So when this whole thing began, it was really tough to sort of get a foothold on where do we get accurate data to report case statistics when it comes to COVID. So we had to work with different data sets. We got, you know, a hold of Johns Hopkins back then before they publicly released their data set. And then we created our public dashboard and that got really great reviews, a lot of excellent views and great feedback. Um, because of our work with the Department of Public Health and the state of California, the governor's office actually noticed the work that we did and they sort of asked us to become part of the dashboard task force for Governor Newsom. So we joined that task force at the end of March and then that's when the work really began for California, California's response to, to COVID using data. And since then, we've been releasing, you know, both a, a mix of public dashboards to inform the, you know, the constituents of California what's happening in the state. And then there's a, a full set of internal dashboards that look at very deep metrics around what's happening with COVID, the effects of COVID on the economy, the effects of COVID 
on the population, on the homeless population, on facilities? Um, how do we reopen appropriately? So we've been involved in pretty much all of those efforts and we've been you know, behind the scenes, essentially developing a lot of the data engineering, data architecture, data flows, and dashboards to support this entire thing. Um, we did a, a second release back in June of additional public dashboards. Our first public dashboard was quite basic in nature. It was very similar to our own public dashboard that we released as a company. Um, and then we released a whole set of, of things back in June that I'll show you. And then we're actually having another release uh, next week of more information. So here's what we showed. So this is our dashboard that we put out, um, that we built essentially eternally and we published it out to Tableau Public. And what we did was we combined data from Johns Hopkins, CDC and, and WHO, and also the China um, CDC to sort of show what's happening with COVID at that time. And you know the, the dashboard, I think we still have it live. The dashboard itself, it's, it's quite simple in nature. So you know, it, it, what we wanted to do is take a very simplistic approach to the visualizations. And here it is um, embedded in the San Diego Union Tribune website. So we wanted to take a very simplistic approach. So you know, we were one of the first ones to kind of have this banner with the total number of confirmed deaths and, and cases. We also wanted to use very non um, strenuous colors. I know that a lot of the first dashboards that got released, you know, they would paint deaths in red and and cases in green, and we didn't want to do that. Um, you know, we're we're very uh, specific in in our designs and our visualistic approaches to to showing data. So we wanted to use a very neutral color. As you can see throughout here, we're kind of focusing on like an offset of gold. And then we have a waffle map that kind of shows you the cases. And we've been changing the gradient here because it's been going up and down in certain, in certain states. So you can kind of see how it's, you know, how it's progressing through the US. Um, we had a timeline which looked a little better than this. This is actually not a line, but this is a, a bar chart that's floating. And earlier on, it was really effective to look at the visualization this way because you could see the day-to-day -day change. Now, because we just have so much data, this almost looks like a line. And since the, the daily um, cases have kind of been pretty steady, unfortunately still high, but pretty steady, you know, that, that bar has been pretty much the same size since, um, since about June or July. And then we've got a, you know, something here that, that shows you the outcome. So this is more based on studies. So it shows you the percentage of hospitalized and not hospitalized. And these are of the confirmed positive cases. So this isn't 53% of the population that thought they had COVID. This is just confirmed cases that were actually tested. And of course, it's gonna be misleading to look at the data this way because confirmed cases that are actually tested are going to be your severe cases. So that's why you're going to see quite a bit of hospitalization and intensive care. This shows you the ICU and admission by age. This is case fatality percentage by age group. And then you've got case fatality by pre-existing condition. And then we do a comparison based on Fauci's study of the fatality rate of the seasonal flu versus COVID-19 and then the infectiousness. So again, this, this had hundreds of thousands of views, very well received. And this was sort of our jumping point into getting into working with the governor's office and becoming part of the dashboard task force. So when we joined the task force back in March, there was some visualizations developed in ArcGIS. Um, there was quite a bit of challenge to getting those visualizations updated with the frequency that needed to be done. So we were brought on, we converted quite a bit of it to Tableau. And then we did a lot of data engineering work to get the data flowing. So here's a screenshot of one of our cases dashboards. Um, it's an integration of data from multiple agencies. So as I mentioned, we, we partnered with the Department of Technology and they're sort of the, the housing agency that, you know, essentially funds us and then also uh, maintains and pays for a lot of the infrastructure that goes behind all of this. So, you know, the Tableau server environment, um, the data engineering environment, it's all sort of paid for centrally by the Department of Technology. And then we work with on their behalf directly with 
a lot of the agencies to sort of get that data into the dashboards in a daily fashion. So we work with the Department of Public Health, Healthcare Services, Social Services, the Sheriff's Office, so on and so forth. And most of the dashboards that we put out, at least in that first wave, we're really looking at cases, testing, and deaths. That's what everybody wanted to know. You know, what's your daily caseload? What's your daily death toll? And what's your daily testing? And then after we got a really good you know, handle on that data, and that was flowing quite well, with the exception of what happened with CalReady about two months ago, um, we started looking at ICU admissions and bed availability because there was this very strong concern that there would not be enough facilities to house a lot of the, you know, the sick patients, either they're you know, in, in general admission or in ICU. And then, of course, we moved on to analyzing PPE supply and demand. And as you guys recall, there was a lot of concern about ventilator availability back then. Um, you know, we were loaning our ventilators out to other states, and then those needed to come back and managing that whole thing. So we were working with the Office of Emergency Services on all the PPE supply and demand analytics. And then we were also looking at um, analysis and putting dashboards together about where can we alternatively house patients if there's not enough beds. So looking at alternative facilities and things like that. So all of this was a monumental effort. Um, the dashboards themselves, they, you know, we, we kind of put our simplistic white background, you know, removed access type viewpoint on a lot of these because we really wanted to do two things. One, you know, we always like to show data in a very simplistic way, have neutral colors. Uh, but secondly, the governor actually would take these dashboards and, and his staff would print them out for him. So we really needed to design them to not only match like, um, you know, a, a very simplistic aesthetic online, because a lot of these are also embedded in websites. We wanted to be able to have the, the governor's staff print it out for him. So when he's on the road to his conferences every day where he presents what's happening with COVID, he actually has the printout of these dashboards ready to go. So this sort of met both of those design principles. And here's a, a, a zoom in on the, what we call the cases dashboard. So as you can see here, we've got the counties on the left, and then we've got the positive case, uh, you know, daily change, the same thing with the deaths and the same thing with the lab tests. And then we have a map, a very simple map showing you, you know, sort of county by county where you've got the incidence rate. And then we've got a breakdown by gender and race and ethnicity. So this is printed out for the governor every single day and he looks at it on paper. And then we've also got it online as well on the covid19.ca.gov website. Since we launched, we've got 40 million, over 40 million views. So this dashboard is heavily, heavily viewed, not only by, you know, the, all the offices that we work with and all the epidemiologists and folks that are part of this entire effort, which is, you know, almost a thousand people, but also by, you know, constituents of California, other states are looking at this as a model. We were one of the first states, if not the first, from what I recall, to release something like this for the public that was sponsored and paid for and created by a state entity. Um, and I think that that sort of was a model for some of the other states to follow. Even if you look at New York, um, we actually were in, in contact with the New York Public Health Commissioner and we were advising them. But they, when they released their dashboards, you could see that they're even following a similar design to what we had uh, for California. So the biggest challenge, so the, the Tableau aspect of this, it's almost the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, what, what you see is a beautiful dashboard, great analysis, wonderful metrics. Um, what you don't see is essentially what's under the water. And what's under the water is the massive effort to get all of these agencies to basically supply their data in a common format in a daily manner so that we could get this information updated um, to be, you know, almost to the minute for the governor and his staff. So we were working with several agencies to make this happen. So we've been working directly with the governor's office, obviously getting their requirements, getting to know what they want to look at. We were working with the Department of Technology on standing up the, the, all of the technology that needs to support this effort. 
And then of course, we, you know, we were working with our, our data partners. So the Department of Public Health supplies a pretty massive part of the information that goes into a lot of these dashboards. So does the department. So does the California Office of Emergency Services. You know, they're handling all the PPE. Department of General Services is giving us a lot of the financial and employment information. Social services is also giving us things like homeless impact and things like that. Um, the sheriff's office, which is not pictured here, is giving us the accurate death count. So we're getting all of this data from all over the place, congregating it into one massive system, and then getting it visualized accurately for the governor and the public to see. And this type of project has really never been done before. Um, you know, we've been working with CDPH for quite some time. So within CDPH, we've made a lot of great leeway in helping their Center for Healthcare Quality, you know, publicly publish a lot of their metrics on complaints and, and quality metrics and getting that whole thing sorted out for them. So internally, CDPH was in a really great position to support this effort. A lot of these other agencies really needed to kind of catch up to where CDPH was. So we were helping them do that. You know, it started off with literally, you know, an email of a file and now it's getting a lot more sophisticated where it's going into, you know, a snowflake system that's uploaded daily and things of that nature. So leading on to the, the technical architecture. So on the surface, the visualization for all of this is Tableau. And this is just a tiny little screenshot of some of our internal dashboards that I can't really show, but um, you know, you can kind of get an idea of what, what those are just by that little thumbnail. But Tableau is essentially the visualization piece of this entire effort. And then in terms of the data aggregation, we're using Snowflake to put all of the data from all of the agencies inside there. And then we're surfacing that in Tableau. And as I mentioned earlier, the data is coming in from lots of different formats, lots of different agencies, everything from CSV files to Excel spreadsheets to SQL server dumps to XML dumps. Um, earlier on, back in March, we were on the phone calling you know, hospitals and getting their numbers and putting them in a spreadsheet and having CDPH folks sign off on that. Um, so you know, it, it's definitely gotten a lot better since then. This was a, a really difficult effort to start with because of the manual nature and by the time we would get our data, we would already get it up and upload it and publish in Tableau. And then the very next minute, we'd start on the data aggregation effort. So it was almost a 24-7 um, shift uh, cycle. And this kind of shows you the count, the, you know, what the day looks like. So you know, there, we do a daily check-in every morning. We have our AM dev time where we're implementing a lot of the features in our dashboards that we gathered from the day before at around 10.45. Um, we publish our public dashboards. The governor has his press conference at 12. So he's referencing a lot of the data sets of our public dashboards. And even if you look at some of his press conferences um, where he looks like he's in a knock center, behind him on those screens, those are our dashboards that are built in Tableau. And then we've got um, what we call our AM to PM handoff. So our AM shift does a lot of the, you know, the new feature development. And then our PM shift comes in and they're doing a lot of the refreshing of the data and implementing and testing a lot of the new features that got developed and all the QA. And that happens till about 10 PM at night. And then we get on the phone with all the stakeholders like Mike Wilkening, the secretary of healthcare services, um, you know, even the governor himself logs on every now and then in the evening, we do a quick check and then we publish the internal dashboards and then the whole process rinse and repeats. Um, I would say anywhere from, April to about June, this process was going on till about three or four in the morning. And then we would start our 845 check-in right after that. So we actually had three shifts at one point and now we've got it narrowed down to an AM shift and a PM shift. Um, and we did all of this with California resources. So our firm doesn't outsource. We don't have anybody in India involved or in other time zones. So this was quite the challenge to have our folks, you know, working till 4 AM, um, some individuals you know, would have to log on at 2 and fix an AM dev shift issue and then be back on at 6 AM to kind of prep for the daily check-in at 8. So we had lots of individuals and in our staff working almost through the night and then jumping on the next day when, when, the, when the cases were rising quite a bit. One of the biggest things that we really wanted to do was you know, the purpose of all of this is to not only help the governor make more informed decisions with a lot of the internal dashboards that we were doing, but also inform the public um, 
from two aspects. One, inform the public of how serious the situation is so that we could, you know, get, um, you know, guidance on a lot of the public health measures like wearing masks and social distancing. And then the second is just sharing the data. California is one of the most populous states in the country. It's the largest economy in the country, fifth largest in the world. And just seeing a lot of this data publicly helps with the overall global effort. So we actually publish a lot of our data sets on the California Open Data Portal, which is uh, data.ca.gov. And you'll see a lot of the data sets there, like the testing data, the PPE data, the hospitalizations data. It's all there for you to download. Um, and of course, the dashboards are there as well. So if you're doing any Epidemiolo epidemiological exercises or research projects. This is excellent data to look at. Um, you know, we've got the WHO, the CDC constantly pulling this data for a lot of their analytics and, and information. And then once we start seeing, you know, vaccine distribution, we're going to be collecting that data at some point. And then hopefully that'll help fuel, you know, the response and, and make things a little bit more efficient and streamlined. So as I mentioned, this was a tremendous effort. Uh, we're not done yet. Things have stabilized for the most part. Um, we, in the last two months, we've been really focusing on optimization. You know, we were sort of underwater at the bottom of the sea with an anchor attached to us, just trying to swim as fast as we can to the surface every single day. Now we're floating on, you know, a plank of wood and we really need to start building a boat. That's kind of what we've been doing is we're, we're trying to get a lot of optimization in place of a lot of this data so that if there is a second surge and a second wave and there's more types of analytics that need to be done, we're prepared for that. And a lot of this information that we've been analyzing and presenting is sort of almost happening in an automatic fashion. And the other challenge is getting the interagency support to maintain a lot of this. So you know, there was a lot of complexities, even with just getting funding for us, because, you know, you know, we, we were working with Department of Technology, but the data is coming from a different department, and we're literally embedding our staff into these other departments. So even getting the contracts figured out was a challenge. Once that was sort of figured out, um, then it was, okay, well, who's going to maintain the cases dashboard? Is it going to be CDPH, or is it going to be CDT, or is it going to be us? And if it's us, you know, how do we do that? And how do we eventually hand that off so that the agencies can maintain it? So we've been figuring all of that out slowly. And, you know, this type of interagency uh, effort and community effort is, is one of the great things that really came out of this thing. So it's sort of the silver lining to the storm of COVID. Um, we know that if something like this ever hits California, that we could really get great community, great data sharing, great technology and infrastructure and automation put in for another type of problem, whether it's a natural disaster or something else. Um, you know, we, we definitely have painted the path for a lot of this interagency development. And I think that was one of the great things that came out of this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'll show you some of the dashboards that we've got, and then I'll open it up for questions. So this is what we call, before I show you this, so this is something that we just launched about a week or two ago. Um, so all of our work is available on covid19.ca.gov. So if you go to that website, all of our public work is here. So right away, I mean, this is coming from our Snowflake instance, getting populated using just some basic JavaScript. Uh, this is not Tableau. Um, but the county map and the state dashboard, those two are, are Tableau. So this county map, this is basically showing you what the different levels are for each county. And then Tableau gets embedded right below that, where you see a Tableau map of every single county and their status. So to kind of go over the statuses, you don't want to be purple. Um, the entire state was purple up until about a few weeks ago. Now we're starting to see some counties go into the substantial and even a select few make it into moderate or even minimal. Um, that's going to be more in the, the rural areas, but a lot of the urban counties are starting to slowly come out of the, the widespread classification and they're moving to what we call substantial. So where I live in San Diego, I think we were one of the first um, metropolitan counties to move into the substantial category. 
And, you know, you can come here, um, you can pick your county. So I'll pick, you know, Sacramento, for example. And then you can enter a business or activity. And then, you know, you get information about, you know, what's, what's open in your county. And, uh, and then at the bottom, you'll see the map, which is, uh, you know, kind of giving you a hover over of what's open and closed within that county. So this is Tableau embedded into the web page. Um, let me go to where the majority of the dashboards are, which are the COVID-19 data and tools. Um, there's going to be a link to this on the homepage. There used to be, but we sort of decommissioned that for now because we want to have folks log on and see the county reopenings. And then we're going to put this back in a couple of weeks. So um, the data dashboard. So I would say, you know, the, this is what we call our cases dashboard. This is the one that has 40 million plus views. And this is a, an overall view of what's happening inside every single county and looking at the cases. So you can see, you know, obviously LA because of its geographic boundaries is going to be by county the largest. Um, you know, the Bay Area is a conglomeration of counties. So, um, but this needs to be broken out because this is just how our government lines are painted. So LA of course is gonna be number one at 270,000 positive cases. And then you can see the metrics by deaths, new cases, and new deaths. And then here's your daily case count. Here's the testing results. Here's the death count. And then you've got the demographic breakdown. So this is probably the most widely used dashboard by both internally and externally. Then we've got a set of other dashboards. So the impact on hospitals, I would say, is the second highly viewed one. This is also in the tens of millions. So this is showing you positive patients, suspected patients, um, ICU positive patients, ICU suspected patients, ICU available beds, a lot of great internal metrics about what's happening in the hospitals. We also have um, a little metric here showing you the uh, reporting rate. So we've got you know 96% of facilities reporting the data and 98% of the beds reporting the data. There's a big difference in beds and facilities. So that's really important to take into account. Um, so the other thing that we were doing recently in working with a lot of the epidemiologists was, you know, a lot of the data was always based on the date of the test. Now we're really basing it on what we call an epi date or epidemiological date, which is when the date of which we think you started exhibiting sy symptoms. Looking at that as, as providing much more accurate data in terms of what we're able to see in terms of the trends and the cases. Um, you know, someone could be sick with COVID for two weeks before they get a test result. Uh, others could be on day three. Others could be almost recovered, right? And they just got the test because of, for travel reasons or work reasons. Um, so, you know, we really want to use that epidemiological date to plot a lot of the information on the axes so that you could get a really accurate trend of what's happening. Um, the other dashboards that we have that are public are dashboards that show PPE distribution, uh, bed surge data. There's a dashboard that we have that shows the impact on the homeless population. Um, the reason why this is such a major issue is because it's really viewed that the homeless population is almost like a super spreading type population. Um, these individuals can't quarantine effectively. These individuals um, you know, get very sick. They're out in the streets, they're out in the public. So the, you, know, you really want to have really great uh, measures to be able to get these individuals into a place where they could effectively quarantine and effectively recover. And so this is showing you the, you know, the hotel rooms that are being paid by the government, and how many are secured and how many are occupied and the percent of which are occupied and so on and so forth. So that's a very key uh, metric that we're getting from the Department of Social Services. We're also doing quite a bit of the identification of this, um, you know, there's areas of California where there's not a lot of homeless people. And, you know, if you're going to be showing the metric of how many people are in those beds, you can probably figure out which homeless person that was. So we're doing a lot of de-identification with that and also with the cases as well, because again, if you're getting into the really rural counties and we're showing things down to certain levels, you can probably figure out um, you know, uh, where an individual resides with COVID. Um, you know, there's pluses and minuses of knowing that data, um, you know, and 
the governments around the world have been dealing with this differently. In the U.S., we've got a lot of strict HIPAA co you know, compliance that we need to follow. So that needs to be very, very carefully de-identified so that that information can't be figured out. Um, so we've been doing a lot of that de-identification and, and, um, and suppression of the data. So um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I could definitely talk and show more, but I feel yeah, like- we have, about, we have about two minutes uh, to stay on time. So maybe we can open it up for questions in the chat. And if Let's do it. We can roll on from there. Anything in the chat that you see, Gina or Mike? Otherwise we can, uh, Steve can stop sharing. I currently don't see any questions. Okay. Then we can stop sharing. Looks I had one quick question for you, Steve, before we move on to uh, UCSF, maybe you can address maybe within, you know, it doesn't have to be a long answer, but anything that, you know, this was an iterative process, right? So you spun up dashboards really quickly at the beginning. It sort of um, phased into different releases. Was there anything unexpected that happened, you know, over the course of, let's say, the last couple of months that um, that wasn't anticipated at the beginning? You know, is it is it more mobile responsive devices or, you know, things that the public were looking for or maybe any other things that, you, that were unexpected? From a technology span standpoint, you know, I think that things have been quite streamlined. There wasn't anything that we released where we were like, wow, this is something that's never happened before with Tableau. Um, you know, I think the biggest unexpected moment we had was sort of in the beginning when we found out and we were quite surprised that this needed to be printed. Um, you know, we're very <laughs> used to having stakeholders, you know, either convert them to more of like a static format into like a dashboard. And that first dashboard is usually something very infographic like and then it kind of gets more complex with more filters. So when we learned that, you know, we needed to solve with the single dashboard, we wanted it to be able to be printed and embedded in a website. Um, that was, I think, the biggest surprise. And since then, it's been, from a technology standpoint, quite steady. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of data surprises um, and that we've been solving, you know, as they come up. But from a visualization standpoint, that was the only one. Sounds good. And I do think there is a question in the chat. What did you use to combine and move data to Snowflake? Good question. So um, it really depends on a lot of the, uh, on what was coming in. So when it came to um, files, there's a really good Snowflake mechanism to import files. When it came to database exports, we we're using some of the tools that were available there. We looked at a lot of different ETL solutions. So, you know, we looked at things like Informatica, um, Talend. Um, there's a lot of other smaller niche things that are out there. We just couldn't really get our head above water enough to implement them. So it was really just a lot of just manual scripting and development to get that data in. So we obviously wrote a lot of SQL, custom SQL packages that are running, um, a lot of Python code, that's uh, custom. It's obviously not the best thing. I would have rather have used more of a commercial product, but to procure, set that up, test it, get it running, pick the right one. We just never got to it. Um, we're looking at that now, um, but I think the focus really now is we're we're looking more. You know, the data engineering side is being solved by people rather than products, and we've got individuals doing that. What we're really looking at now is is behavior analytics. We want to see. You know, not only what are folks doing in the dashboards, but, you know, what could we add to them to kind of better inform the public? And so we've got this uh, product that we're using called Sintasa that's based on behavior analytics. So we've been looking at that. And that's been giving us a lot of really interesting insight. Cool. Thank you, Steve. We appreciate it. Appreciate your time. And Absolutely. with that, uh, we can send it over to Mike or... Um, yeah. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Very informative as a citizen of this state. Um, hey, is uh, Greg Hall, I see you on. Are you able to unmute yourself? Hello, hello. Let me see here. Uh, 
I am unmuting him, so he should be able to speak. Thanks, Gina. Unmute. Okay. There we go. Now, all right. There we go. So I click on share screen. Hopefully, I get this right. Yep. Um, Greg, I've uh, I've pretty much called you out as an expert on Zoom, being that you guys all use Zoom so much. Oh, we're you. using. We're actually using Team now. I don't know. I'm not. Oh. Oh, can you see one. my screen? Can you see the landing? Yeah, yeah we can. You see where it says UCSF applications, correct? Fantastic. Hey, so I just oh, introduce yeah. Greg. I've been working with Greg for many years. He's uh, one of the folks that has uh, really kind of got pretty technical with Tableau, doing some really, really cool stuff. He actually even has, I went out and saw your YouTube uh, site, Greg. It's actually growing all the time. And I even saw that you have this presentation or a, a version of it out there already, which is fantastic. Um, but this is a, a presentation I know, Greg, that you did at the last UCSF Tableau user group meeting. It was really well received. And, you know, we keep hearing from our customers that they, uh, during these CalTug meetings, they also would like to see us maybe, again, roll up our sleeves a little bit and get a little more in a technical with the product. Because uh, we do get a lot, a lot of people that are, you know, day-to-day -day users of Tableau. So um, this is exactly that type of a session that we want to start presenting on a more often basis. So anybody else that watches this, if you've got a tip or trick or anything else, we would love to have you for our next one. And um, without further ado, Greg, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much a repeat of that YouTube video or the presentation I did at the UCSF Tableau Users Group. I don't do a lot of presentations, maybe once in a blue moon, so bear with me. And I haven't done Tableau in a while, so I'm, I might be a little rusty, so hopefully I can get through this. But let me get started. So um, I'm a, I work for UCSF School of Pharmacy, and I'm a database web developer there. And so before I get started, let me go over what I'm going to cover. So again, this is the same presentation, a subset of the presentation I did at the UCSF Tableau Users Group. So we have a bunch of slides and I'm gonna zoom in. So to speed things up, I'm going to, I'm gonna skip a lot of things here. We're gonna cover two topics. So one of the topics I'm gonna cover is how to, how to resolve a set actions issue. So I just learned about set actions last year at the Tableau Conference 2019. I can show you a page here, a slide. So this is the Tableau Conference 2019. You can see here 2019 highlights. Under self-service analytics, there's set and parameter actions. So set actions was a really hot topic at the Tableau Conference 2019. So we're going to resolve a Tableau issue, or I'm going to try to resolve it. And the second topic I'm going to talk about is uh, we're going to talk about the JavaScript API. And I'm going to focus on the event listener. So with the JavaScript API event listeners, you can select objects from your Tableau dashboard and collect the values of those objects. And for example, drill down to other Tableau dashboards or use those values for your own interfaces, such as we use Telerik components and reporting services, or you can save it to your database. So those are the two topics I'm gonna to talk about. So I'm gonna skip a lot of things here because you know, given the time. So over here, um, this is the set actions issue I am going to resolve. So what happens here, this is the issue. When we select objects to get something called our ins and outs, that's set actions in Tableau. We get our ins and outs, this orange and gray, but the totals on top disappear. And that's why you're gonna see this panicking emoji and this lady screaming, where's my totals? Because there should be totals on top. So I'm gonna resolve that issue using my Tableau desktop. And once we resolve that issue, you're gonna see this happy emoji here. And so when we select our categories, we're gonna get our ins and outs and the totals on top will stay intact. And we're also gonna talk about the JavaScript API focusing on the event listeners. So with the event listeners, you can select objects, you can get the field name, you can get the values from the objects you selected, and you can get the you know, in this case, in categories to drill down to other Tableau dashboards, such as this tree map, word cloud, and you can select objects to get something called your ins and outs. This is set actions, and we'll go over that. What else? And you can use the values. If you use 
we use .NET MVC C Sharp, and we use Teller components and reporting services a lot. So once you select your objects in Tableau using the JavaScript API event listeners, you can get the values and you can put it into your own interfaces that you feel comfortable with. At UCSF, we use Drupal a lot and we use Salesforce with the Apex language. So here's a grid and Teller components. We have drag and drop sorting with the values we got from Tableau. Here's reporting services where you can, it's a report writer where you can write really complex reports. So what else do I have here? So basically, yeah. So here I have something where you can have images. Um, you can use shapes in Tableau so you can have um, images here. So in here we have our sliding parameter where we can change the value here. So right here it just says there's 20, meaning that if there's 20 or more patient case records, we have our up categories. Anything less than 20, we have our down categories. And we can change the values here with our uh, Tableau parameter slider. And what else do I have? So this is feedback. This is our feedback interface. We probably don't have time to go over that. But you don't, we have a feedback interface, but you can use email. But I think it's really important to get feedback. So I have here, it says feedback is valuable information that can be used to make Important decisions, effective feedback has benefits for the giver, the receiver, and the wider organization. So like for me, I'm a programmer developer. I have a lot of tunnel vision. So it's really good to get feedback from others. So you can do it just by email. So without further ado, I am going to close this and let's get started. So I'll close this guy. Here's our landing page. I'm going to go to our education department, OEIS website. I'll click here. It's going to bring up our login screen. Oh, it's taking a bit, should come up really quick, but hopefully it'll come up. Okay, good. So here's our login screen. Here's my user ID and password. I'm gonna log in. Ooh, kind of slow. So, ah, well, let me make it three columns. So over here, what I'm going to, so under the patient case bank or patient case bank system, I'm going to click on Tableau category counts. So I'm currently developing applications for our education department. I'm, I'm developing, you know, I pretty much finished this guy. I'm, I'm developing another application for them. So, okay, so I'm going to click here, Tableau category counts. So it's going to bring up a dashboard from Tableau public. So one of the issues we have with set actions in Tableau is that when we select our, our categories, we get something called our ins and outs, but our totals here on top will disappear. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let me click here on set actions broken with this panicking emoji. So I'll select, I'll select some categories here. Notice I get my ins and outs, but the totals on top disappear. And so ins and outs, what are ins and outs? I have my help button here. It says here, if the condition is true for a given record, then that record is included in the set in, which is your in orange here. And if the criteria are not met, then the record is excluded from the set outs, which is in gray. So again, I get my ins and outs, but my totals on top disappear. And that's why you see this panicking emoji and this lady screaming, where's my Okay, no worries. I can click here on set action fix with this happy emoji. So now, now when I select the same categories, I get my ins and outs and the totals on top stay intact. So now I can say, I have 40 out of 71 that are easy among the selected categories here, objects here. And I have 114 out of 142 that are intermediate. So how did I get my totals to stay intact? So now I'm going to go to my Tableau desktop. So here's my, our data source. It's coming from a store procedure in Microsoft SQL Server. And Tableau uses Microsoft SQL Server as their backend database as well. So here I just group by categories and difficulties to get my accounts. You can see, let's see, what do I have? Let me. So these, I have a couple of sheets here. Here's my categories, my horizontal bar chart, my counts. I have my vertical bar chart here, my difficulty fields. 
easy, intermediate, and hard, and my dashboard. So the key to this is to, to get your totals to stay on top is to make this guy dual access. So let me show you what I mean by that. Let me open up a brand new sheet. I'm gonna hide my title. I'm gonna drag my difficulty field on top of the column shell. I'm gonna drag my count field on top of rows. So now I have- Sorry, a Greg. Yes. For some yes. reason, we cannot see the screen. Oh, you can't see the screen. Oh, that's what I was asking if you could see my screen earlier. So you never could see my screen at all the whole entire time. Is well, the screen is frozen. Only show the dashboard. It didn't show your desktop. Oh, that's weird. Why is that? How do I go? Let me go new share then. Should I go new share? You are, since you're, or should I go stop share and try it again? Let me stop share and try it again. Okay. Um, share screen. And how about now? Can you see it? Do you see a vertical bar? Yes. Yeah. 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 God, I'm not, I think I might have to stop everything. Maybe I did it wrong. I'm not sure. Maybe I didn't share the screen properly. So I don't know if we can. Um, so what I did basically, I don't know. I basically took the difficulty fields. If you didn't see it, I put it up here on the column shelf. I took the count and I put it on the rows shelf. And that's how I got this vertical bar right here. And again, I'm going to, yeah, let's, let me continue. So here it says easy, hard, and intermediate. It probably should read easy, intermediate, and hard. What I can do here, no worries. I can go to my difficulty field, go to sort, and on the data source order drop down, I can select manual, highlight, it, click my up arrow. So now it reads easy, intermediate, and hard. So easy, intermediate, and hard. And I'm going to drag my count on top of labels. So we have totals on top of each vertical bar. Then I'm going to drag my category set on top of colors. So to get your category set, all you have to do is go to your category field, just go to create and click on set. So that's how I got my category set. So when I, when I drag this on top of color, I get my ins and outs. So, so you would think this is all you should have to do. But the issue we have is that when we select our objects or when we select our categories, God, you couldn't see it earlier. That's too bad. So we missed out on a lot of stuff. Shoot. So when we select our categories, um, you'll get your ins and outs, but the totals on top will disappear. So let me show you how to fix that. So what you can do is make this dual axis. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get my measured values and place it on right over here. And now we have two, we have two vertical bar charts, one for, for the sum count and one for measured values. So we'll make this dual axis. We'll go to the sum count drop down and click on dual axis. So now we have one chart layered on top of another chart. And what we can do here to make this back to a bar, we're on sum count. I can go to automatic, click on bar and do the same for the measured values layer. Again, we have two layers, right? We have to, some count layer and measured values layer. So I can come here and make this a bar. So now we have one bar chart layered on top of another bar chart. We don't need the positioning of the arrows, the sum IDs, measure names. So the key to this is to get rid of the ins and outs because it's the ins and outs that are causing the totals on top to disappear. And we're on the measured values layer. So as soon as I take this guy out, um, no, so I can take this guy out. These totals will always stay on top on this layer. I hope, I'm, hope you guys are following me. Notice it's a bit fuzzy, no worries. I can right click here and click on synchronize axis. Now we have one vertical bar chart layered exactly on top of another one. So these totals will stay on top and you're gonna get your ins and outs because on the other layer, on your sum count layer, click on that, we don't need measure values. We have our ins and outs here, our category set on top of color. So it's okay for these totals to stay on top once we get our ins and outs because in our measured values, we took out the category set out of color. So these totals will stay intact. So now when we select our categories, the totals will stay on top. We have to do one more thing, something called actions. So I have to go to my, 
my um, my desktop, my or excuse me, my dashboard. So in my dashboard, you have I created the actions already, but let me just show you how that works. So there's some called your, your so I again I already have it. I'll, I'll show you my settings, but if you want to create some called your set actions, change set values, you would go to your add actions. Again, I did it already, so I'll just show you what I did. So I'll highlight this, click on edit. Here's our category set, here's our dashboard. Here's the, what you would check here is this sheet here. This is the sheet where I'm selecting my categories to get my ins and outs, that's gonna be checked. This is unchecked, this is this sheet here. You're not selecting your categories to get your ins and outs, so this is, and here, this is just the data source. We have our category set, make sure select is selected and remove all values from set is marked. So that's pretty much it. So now when I select my, my categories, I'll get my ins and outs and the totals on top will stay intact. So I hope that makes sense. I, I know you guys missed some stuff. You guys didn't see this, but I was in my broken one. Let me just backtrack really quick. So the, the issue we had before was that since you didn't see this, I just quickly do this. When I was selected objects, if you don't use dual axis, you'll get your ins and outs, but the totals on top will disappear. So that's what was happening there. But once you make this guy dual axis, when we select our objects and get our ins and outs, the totals will stay intact on top. So let me quickly go over a couple of other things, and this will be a short um, presentation. Let me reload. So here we have images. So you can, do, you can have shapes um, in Tableau. So we have what we call our up categories and down categories. So here we have our sliding parameter. We can change the value, but right now it says 20, it defaults at 20, meaning that if we have 20 or more patient case records, we have our, what we call our up categories. And if we have anything less than that, we have our down categories. But again, we can change, we can use the slider and change this like so. And now it's, so if it's more than 47, we have more than, than 47 that we have our up categories. So now we have cardiovascular and infectious diseases. If a patient case less than, less than 47 patient case records, then we have our down categories. So that's pretty much, you can have shapes, which is pretty cool in Tableau. So my favorite topic is probably the JavaScript API event listener. So let me read, no, I don't need to reload this. So with the, with the API event listeners, you can select objects. Let me just select same four, and you can get the objects here. You can get what you selected. So how did I do that? So I have documentation below our dashboard. So in the Tableau, in the Tableau conference, 2019 that I attended last year, there was an hour and hour, I can't remember, it was either an hour or hour and a half hands-on training. And they said, all you need to know is pretty much working knowledge of HTML and JavaScript. And basically they make you do a lot of copying and pasting of the JavaScript API. And they go over things so you can learn how to use it to massage it to make it work on your dashboard. So the part that really that I enjoyed looking at was the event listeners. And it's really easy to do. They pretty much, you can get the, you can get the code from them. I mean, you can Google this too, um, the Tableau JavaScript API, and you probably can find this anywhere. And you can just massage it to make it work on your, on your, um, on your dashboard. So it's really easy. I'll just briefly go over this really quick. So it's just a method here. When you select your objects in Tableau, um, basically, it's just doing a for loop. It's just looping through everything. And once it sees that my field name is category, it's category, it's just getting the value of that category and putting it into a variable. So it's looping through, you know, all my selections. It's concatenating all the, all the values into a variable. And once it's finished with the loop, it's done with all the categories you selected. All it's doing is taking that variable um, via the element ID and assigning it to an HTML input type text. That's all it's doing. That's pretty much all you have to do. And once you have the information here, you can do whatever you want with it. You can save it to your database. We have two examples here that I'm gonna show you. 
So what, what I did, I can click on this button. It's called, I just called it event log. Hopefully you can see this, hopefully. Um, so, when t so right here, so once you, once you select your data or your value, your objects to get your values, you can get your field names, you can get the values, you can do whatever you want with it. You can parse it, you can save it to your database. You can, in, in our case, in this example, I took the categories and I drilled down to, to create other Tableau dashboards, such as this tree map, this word cloud, I can select categories here to get my ins and outs. And notice the totals on top stay intact because I'm using dual axis. And one last thing I'm gonna show you and I'm pretty much done with this presentation is that with these categories, I can, we can use our own, what we feel comfortable with. Again, we're using .NET, MVC, C Sharp, and we use a lot of reporting services and something called Telerik components. So I can post what I just selected here, post categories. Now we're no longer in Tableau. We're using interfaces that we feel comfortable, but we can get the values from Tableau. For example, this is a, some called a Telerik component. Once we got the values, we can do drag and drop sorting. You know, and there's, there's filtering, there's sorting on any column and filtering on any column. We can, you know, there's, you can go to reporting services and, you know, we have, we have a report writer here. We can do more complex report, export to various formats, print it out, stuff like that. And, and or go to detailed information. We have some called our flyout menus. Yeah, so this part is in Tableau, but we can get the values from using the event later, event listeners from Tableau and do whatever we want with it. So that's, I think that's pretty much Tableau Barton. Let's go back to Tableau. So what we do in um, at UCS, we have a lot of prototypes here, you know, a lot of things. We even did games too. So, um, so this is on set actions. We have stuff on, you know, um, set parameters and stuff like that. So, so we have a lot of prototyping here. So, actually, that's pretty much it. I have a lot there. There's a bunch of stuff I can show you, games and stuff we did for fun too. But I think just I think I pretty much covered what I wanted to go over, which was the set, resolving the set actions issue and, and using the um, JavaScript API event listeners. So, so if you guys have any questions, just go, sh yeah, just let me know. Pretty much what I want. And, and Greg, this is, yeah. And Greg, this is Mike, that's great, a great session. But I did want to say also that I think I did see out there in your YouTube channel, we could send a link out to that that mm -hmm. it's it, it, a little abbreviated version of this. Is that correct? Or what did you put out yeah, there? This is, a, oh, this is more of a subset of what I did because I tried to, okay. yeah. Because I didn't know how much time I had. You know, I knew know that there's only a half an hour or so. So I wanted to make sure I could cover everything. I mean, I have a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, no, this is great. Uh, and and yeah. we'll make sure we also, we'll make sure we get the link out to everybody as well. So they have the full version. Um, any questions for Greg at this point? Okay. I don't think so. Greg, that is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate that awesome session. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I'll stop my share. Okay. So Kenny, I think we're uh, what about 15 minutes. We're, we're darn close. I am so impressed. These presenters have been just spot on with their times today. <laughs> we are like four minutes early um, as far as uh, where we were supposed to be. So that said, um, Kenny, I, I guess we open it up. Are there any uh, questions, you know, anything pertaining to what you've seen today, Tableau related, uh, Tableau conference, TC20 related, any questions that anybody would have at this point? Yeah, we addressed a few questions that were in the chat, but I don't see any new ones. Um, now is your chance. And I guess we will give the uh, obligatory uh, plug here that, uh, hey, if anybody has a uh, session that they would like to give at our next Caltech, I think we're gonna try to do, Kenny, I think we're gonna try to do one more here before the end of the year is what the plan was. Try to do, we try to do four year, uh, COVID kind of got us off track a little bit. So at this point in time, I think we've done three, right, Kenny? Yeah, we would have one more would, would yeah. give us four. Uh, so uh, same thing, we're gonna do this one virtually, a date to be announced, but if anybody has, 
you know, I really like the ones that we had today, really kind of went at a high level all the way down to a lower level in that, you know, getting to the specifics of the application. So all sessions are good. If anybody would like to offer a presentation of what they're doing in their organizations, we'd love to have you. Um, just reach out to Kenny or I or anybody else on, on as far as your Tableau uh, connections. Kenny, anything else yeah. you want to cover? Yeah, one, one quick question that was uh, in, in the chat. Maybe I'll put Jared on the spot. Um, for this one is should we learn Java API when working with Tableau system? I think Jared's busy learning Java API right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jared can hear. Oh, I, I tried to unmute myself. I think someone else muted me at the same time. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, the JavaScript API is, a neat enhancement. It makes, you know, Tableau extensible where you can say, I want to expand out to other different formats, other different languages. So if you want to take what Tableau offers out of the box and say, you know what, I, I want mine to be completely unique. I want to have something that no one else has with a different look and feel than anybody else out there in Tableau, then it might be a good idea to learn JavaScript. Um, I think that, so I've been using Tableau for over five years now, and I would say I've never had a need to use JavaScript but it's always been a, a possibility. So I uh, hope that answers the question. If not, just shoot me another, you know, question and I'll try to, you know, add more detail. Thanks, Jared. And we had one additional question, just will the presentation be shared via email? And we are, we did record all of our presenters today and we will be sharing it out via email. Thanks, Gina. I think we're good from here. The only thing that I would um, add is if people are interested in specific areas for these user groups, you know, feel free to reach out to Mike and I. We're always interested to know what the community and the users uh, want to hear more about. So if there's any subjects, um, things that are coming out that is top of mind for your department or agency, city or county, just feel free to let us know and we'll, we'll try and um, address those at the next user group. So with that, Mike, I think we could probably wrap it up. Jenny, we have to have one technical snafu. We didn't have one this time. Come on. Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe hanging up will have a problem. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> Thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks so much to our presenters. Those were three fantastic sessions. We do have this recorded. You will get a copy of this. Please forward it on to anyone in your organization that might have an interest in some of these. And again, um, thanks everyone for participating today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.